Okay, let's go to the next case. Uh, chief complaint, I'm having a heart attack. A 23-year-old graduate student comes to the student health care center because she feels she's having a heart attack about once a week for the past six to eight weeks. Let's stop right there. Is it possible to have a heart attack every week for the last six weeks? You know, I'm assuming it can happen, but chances are it does not happen. Uh, the episodes always occur out of the blue. This is significant because when you see out of the blue, what does that mean? It means no significant stressor. And when we see that, what's the first thing that should pop into your head? Panic. Panic disorder. People who have panic disorder tend to have these attacks that occur out of the blue. And because they occur out of the blue, that is why so many of these patients with panic end up staying home. So many of them develop something called agoraphobia because they're afraid of going out and doing something, being in a restaurant, being in a movie, being in a theater, going shopping, and all of a sudden the attack hits them. And they don't know what to do. They don't know where to get, for, get help. So what do you do? You feel more comfortable at home where you know where the phone is, you know what to do. So that's why many of them end up being homebound. So that's what's significant about out of the blue. It's not that someone puts a gun in your head and you develop a panic attack. It's that you're not doing anything that's stressful and you develop the attack. She describes an accompanying fear that is so intense that she thinks she's going to die or go crazy. This is also typically seen in patients who have panic disorder. <clears throat> the patient visited the emergency room three weeks ago with a similar attack. An EKG was done and it was normal and she was sent home. Because she has since then experienced more attacks, she's now afraid to drive. So maybe she's beginning to have the agoraphobia that I was talking about. This is always in the question. This is how they get you. She has a family history of cardiac problems. That's always there so that it leads you down the wrong path. So you start doing all sorts of super expensive heart tests and forget about panic. Um, her Duke grandparents and her father died of MIs. Let's see the physical. Temperature is uh, 99.3, blood pressure 120 over 78, respiration is 22 and pulse is 88. How are her vitals? They look pretty normal to me. Uh, cardiovascular exam shows regular heart rate and rhythm with a normal S1 and S2 and no murmurs. Her lung are clear. Uh, the abdomen is benign. So with that presentation, what should be the first thing that you think of? Is it possible that she truly has some heart problem? So that should be your first differential. We're going to think of heart disease. What else do we think of? What else can mimic anxiety like this? When your blood glucose drops, hypoglycemia can mimic that. What else can mimic this? Hypothyroidism can do it. Substance abuse, especially the one that I was talking about earlier, Caffeinism can mimic this anxiety, these feelings that something's all of a sudden come over you and you don't know what to do. Panic disorder, of course. Generalized anxiety disorder. And supraventricular tachycardia. Anything else that you can think of? What? How common is FIO with the blood pressure? Oh, dear. Let's go back to the blood pressure. What's the blood pressure? 120, 78. Can you have normal blood pressure with FIO? You can. You can. But typically for the test, remember for the test, what is it about? It's about the obvious things. They're not going to ask you one thing out of 10 million. If you have FIO for the test, what do you think will be in the physical exam? Will you have high blood pressure? You're going to have the high blood pressure. So that's why FIO is not in there. So let's go back to this. Okay. Okay, so the first thing, if we think of heart disease, what's the first thing we want to do? EKG. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to come back normal. If we're thinking of hyperthyroidism, because that mimics anxiety, mania, etc., what do we do? Thyroid function, and what do you think? It's going to come back normal. CBC chemical screen is going to come back normal. Blood glucose is going to come back normal. And this is typically what you find in these patients. When you think of panic patients, patients with panic disorder, which is what you know this patient has, if you do a study and look at all the patients that go to the medical emergency room, psychiatric patients that go to the medical emergency room, who do you think goes more than anybody else? 
but patients who have panic disorder. And why do these patients go to the emergency room all the time? Because they think they're having a heart attack. That's what's common about panic disorder. Because what happens when we have panic? We have autonomic hyperactivity. We have shortness of breath. We have sweating. We have numbness in our extremities. Do those things occur in people who have heart attacks? Yes. So it mimics that. So that's why they end up going to the heart to the hospital so often. Let's get more information from her. We also learn that she has no circumscribed fears. She has no trouble leaving her home. She denies suicidal ideation. She denies hallucinations, delusions, or the use of substances. So we already ruled one out. Uh, she's got no vegetative signs of depression, for example, weight loss, insomnia, or anhedonia. Let's go to the review. Let's talk about panic. What do we know about panic? Unexpected panic attacks. So this is a patient who, out of the blue, will have a panic attack. And what is a panic attack? It's a massive amount of anxiety, which lasts typically around less than 20 minutes. So all of a sudden, you're hit with this huge amount of anxiety. Your heart beats really fast. You start to sweat. Your mouth gets dry. Your hands shake. The best way for me to describe it is, I always use this example. Do you know how you feel when you get the test scores in the mail? Do you know that sensation when you, you go to the mailbox and you open it and you're looking at the envelope that you know is from the test? And what happens when you're holding that envelope? What's happening to your hands? Your hands are shaking. What's happening to your mouth? What's happening to your heart? That is what anxiety is all about. Now, you've experienced that. I'm sure you have. I know I have. Everybody in this room has. Now, multiply that times 10,000. How awful do you think that is? And that it was panic attack was all about. So it's not little bits of anxiety. It's massive amounts of anxiety that all of a sudden hits you. And that's what these patients experience. And you're going to have concern about the attacks. You worry about the consequences of the attack and you're going to have a significant change in behavior related to the attack so to the point that many of them do what many of them stay home uh... the panic attacks are not due to substances let's talk about that it's very important for you for this test to know what triggers a panic attack and what does not trigger a panic attack because when we treat patients with panic disorder we tell them to stay away from these substances so what are substances that can trigger an attack Alcohol can do it. Epinephrine can do it. Yohimbine can do it. Flumazenil can do it. But the granddaddy of them all is sodium lactate. Anything with lactate will trigger an attack. And what they do in research centers is that if you have panic disorder, they're going to give you a shot of sodium lactate. They'll infuse it. And more than 70% of these people will have a panic attack. So anybody with an underlying panic disorder that you give them sodium lactate, you'll see that they will have a panic attack. And of course, it may or may not include agoraphobia. Let's look at another. Let's see. I'm going to get to that later. Let's talk about SVT. Can this occur in this patient? Yes, it can. How do we know when you have SVT? First of all, it tends to occur in young patients without evidence of cardiac disease. Did we see that in her? Was she young? Did she have any heart problems? She had a history, but she had no active heart problems. But the EKG had a regular rhythm with a rate of 150 to 250. Uh, P waves may not be seen. You could see a wide QRS complex. What the patient complains of typically is a fast heartbeat. How was her EKG, though? Normal. How was her heart rate? Was It was normal. And the way to treat this, of course, is Valsalva in the supine position. Hyperthyroidism, there's the correction. What we have is tachycardia, tremors, hyperreflexia. You're going to have fine, smooth, velvety skin. You're going to have the nail problems are going to be very brittle. You're going to see the goiter. And, of course, you'll see the exothalamus and the lid retraction. Did we see any of these things in the physical exam of this patient? No, she was a normal patient. And, of course, we did the TSH, and it was normal. And what we find in the lab test is increased free T4 and increased T3, and we treat with PTU propylthiouracil. 
of course, other specialties, I'm sure, will come and focus on this. I don't want you to get all your information from me, the psychiatrist, about this. That doesn't have to be on the tape. Okay. Let's talk about hypoglycemia. Very common for anxiety disorders, I'm sorry, for hypoglycemia, to mimic anxiety disorders. And why is that? Because the patients start to get sweaty, you see. They get tremors. They get tachycardia. They get palpitations. So this is autonomic hyperactivity. And where do we find autonomic hyperactivity? Of course, we find it in all of the anxiety disorders. Patients could have seizures. They could have fatigue. They could have syncope headache. And they also could have behavioral changes. And, of course, the way to treat this is by having them eat something. So ingest some carbohydrates and you will not have hypoglycemia. Generalized anxiety disorder is one of the differentials as well. Let's, I want you to differentiate anxiety levels. I described panic as having, if I had an anxiety meter, all right, zero being the lowest level of anxiety and 10 being the highest level of anxiety, where do you think panic disorder goes? Is it like a one or is it a 10 or maybe a 20? On a scale of 10, panic is a 20. So that's how bad the anxiety is. Generalized anxiety disorder is someone who basically functions, but their level of anxiety is lower. This tends to be seen in older women and women who just worry all the time. They worry about their home. They worry about their children. They worry about their husbands. They worry about their jobs. And should they really have to worry? No. These are women who are probably well-to-do. They've got a job. They've got a husband. They've got kids in Ivy League schools. So there's really nothing for them to worry about. But guess what? They have to worry. Have you heard the saying, the worry ward? That person just worries all the time? That's what this is all about. And not only do they worry, but this is going to be the clue for the test. They're going to be irritable. They cannot concentrate. And they have sleep disturbances. And of course, do you think this affects their relationships? Yes. How many of you have seen the Paxil commercials on TV? Have you seen them? where you can tell that the person on TV is talking to someone that you can't see, you're just no fun anymore. Why do you always argue all the time? Boy, you've changed so much. You're just not fun. Have you seen those commercials? That's a commercial for what kind of disorder? For this. They're talking about generalized anxiety disorder, and that's what Paxil is, one of the drugs that's for it. Paxil, of course, is paroxetine. Okay. Um, And the way we treat generalized anxiety disorders will be probably with the SSRIs. So let's go back to the treatment of this lady. It's in here somewhere. Okay. Remember, she's in the hospital. What do we do with her? Do we treat her as an outpatient or do we admit her into the hospital? How many of you would admit her into the hospital? How many of you feel comfortable treating her as an outpatient? So we treat her as an outpatient. So she's in our office. What do we do? What's the first thing we have to provide for patients who have panic disorder? We're going to provide medical treatment, medication. Now, the medication of choice for patients with panic disorder, the question can be approached in two ways. They could ask you acute treatment or they could ask you long-term treatment. The way to stop a panic attack now, I could stop it cold and it's, or dead in its track, that's how the saying goes, is I'm going to give you a benzodiazepine. And what's the benzo that will probably be the one that gets asked on the test? Alprazolam. So you give the patient alprazolam. And when you give her alprazolam, remember the part about informed consent. Must she give you informed consent for treatment? Yes. So what are we going to tell her about alprazolam? Let's go over the side effects of alprazolam. What are they? Sedation, confusion, memory problems, disinhibition. And what's the big one? Addiction. All of these drugs are extremely addicting. What else is a problem with all of the benzodiazepines? They potentiate the effects of alcohol. So what must you instruct the patient at that time to not do? Do not drink. 
what else do we tell the patients to do? Which I don't understand why, but I find myself doing it all the time. Do not operate heavy machinery, whatever that is. What they mean by that is try not to drive. So if you work in some forklift somewhere, a crane operator, and you pop all sorts of alprazolams in your mouth, who knows what could happen at the other end of that crane because you're going to be so confused that who knows what will happen. So you have to be very careful and talk to the patient about that. And the patient says, yes, I understand that. That's fine. And you begin using alprazolam. Another treatment plan for them long term is the use of an antidepressant. Now, what antidepressant is available? We've got SSRIs, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. We've got the TCAs or we got the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Because we choose drugs for a reason, what is it that we choose drugs for? Side effect profile. So the, what makes a drug first line is not so much efficacy, because if we think of efficacy, all of these drugs work alike. The SSRIs, the TCAs, and the MAOIs all treat depression, all treat anxiety. However, SSRIs are typically considered first line because of the side effect profile. They're cleaner, they're safer, and if you have a patient who takes a drug that gives them less side effects, what do you think happens to that patient? That's a happy patient, that's a compliant patient. So we talk about these things and what does she tell you? Okay, doctor, I want you to tell me the side effects of each. Because if I'm going to make a good informed consent, I need to know everything that's available to me. And what are we going to start with? Do you start with the good news or the bad news? It depends on your style. Have you noticed salesmen, how they always show you something that's really bad but really cheap? And then they work their way up, so they sort of like see, oh, look, this is a bad, and then they finally sold you, and they sold you the most expensive thing in the store. That's how they do it. So if that's your approach, then let's start with the MAOIs. So let me tell you about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They're also good drugs, but what's the problem? You have to watch what you eat, because anything that contains tyramine will produce hypertension. So what does you tell her? No aged cheeses for you. Nothing that looks green, blue, or crumbly. You stay away from that. No red wine for you. No chocolate, no sausage, no nuts. And what if she tells you, oh, what? I have red wine and um, blue cheese every night. Then what do you tell her? Then, ma'am, the Mao inhibitors are not for you. So we go to the next one. Okay, then there's the TCA, the tricyclic antidepressants. Also very good drugs. But they're infamous for certain side effects, anticholinergic side effects. They cause a lot of dry mouth, blurry vision, urinary retention, constipation. They also have a lot of hypotension. So if you're 80, you don't want that person getting up, falling down, and breaking a bone. They also cause sedation, and they also cause weight gain. Why? Because they're blocking histamine. Now, of the TCAs, she says, okay... What's the best one in the class giving me the least amount of side effects? And what's the worst one in this class giving me the worst side, side effect? And what do you tell her? What's the best one, meaning the safest, of the TCAs? Decipramine or nortriptyline. Those are considered the best. Why? Because they have less side effects. Which is the one you avoid at all costs? Amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is very anticholinergic has a lot of hypotension so you would never if you have an 80 year old patient who comes in I hope that you never use amitriptyline as first line because you know what's going to happen to that patient he's not going to see you're going to make him constipated he won't be able to urinate he's going to fall down he's going to break a hip and it's downhill from there so if you're going to use a TCA try to make it nortriptyline or desipramine and then you bring out the stars of the antidepressants, the SSRIs. What are the SSRIs or which ones are they? Let's review. You've got fluoxetine. You've got paroxetine. You've got sertraline. You've got fluvoxamine. And you've got citalopram. Those are the five drugs. Prozac, Paxil, Soloft, Luvox, and Celexa. Now remember for your test, it's all generics. So I don't want you learning commercial names because that's not how they're going to appear on the test. So of all those drugs, 
they all really work alike for the treatment of panic. The problem is that the FDA might not get approval. I'm sorry, the drug company might not get approval for one versus the other. Why? Because it's all marketing. But they all treat anxiety disorders. What are the side effects of the SSRIs that you have to tell her? They have a lot of headaches. Some patients get sedation. Some patients get agitation. They have GI problems. But what's the one thing that most people stop for? Sexual side effects. They're big on sexual side effects. So they tend to cause a lot of anorgasmias, and they tend to cause a lot of ejaculation problems, delayed ejaculation. Now, if you've got a premature ejaculator who's got panic, then you, wow, you hit the jackpot. It's wonderful because you're actually treating everything with one drug. But of the three, what would you recommend? You're going to recommend the SSRI. Would they give you three SSRIs on your test and make you choose one? What do you think? Are they evil or not that evil? They're not that evil. What If they were to do something, what could they do? They could give you an SSRI <coughs> and a TCA and an MAOI. But even that's probably not the way to go for them. They'll probably give you an SSRI and some heart drug and some cholesterol drug and maybe a benzodiazepine. So you know that you're going to focus on what it is that you want. If they're asking you, how do I treat panic? And they give you an SSRI and a benzo, what is your answer then? How do I treat panic now? with a benzodiazepine. So if they make you choose between the SSRI and a benzo, you're going to go for the benzo because I'm going to stop it right away. But if they make the distinction long-term versus acute, then you know the difference. Long-term is SSRI, acute is benzo. And the way that most people do it is the following. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll put you both on a benzo and an SSRI. And you stay on that medication for weeks or a few months. And what do we do? We observe the patient. As the symptoms go away, what do we do then? We try to lower one of the drugs. And what's the one we're first going to try to play with? The benzodiazepine. We taper the dose of the benzodiazepine and watch the patient. If the patient has a resurgence of panic attacks, what does that tell us? That the patient's not ready for you to stop the medication. You put him back on it. Wait a few more weeks, a few months. Lower the dose. If the patient tolerates, wait a little bit. Lower the dose again until they're off of the benzo. Then you keep them only on the SSRI. And then can you start lowering the SSRI? Definitely. No one in psychiatry will only treat you for six months. Most of these patients get treated for um, six months to years. Why? Because all of these disorders are very chronic and very debilitating. And what is it about panic that worries physicians as well? If you have a patient with panic, remember, do you know when the attacks occur? You don't know. So you're living your life in fear. When is this going to happen? It's an awful sensation. So what do you think a lot of them resort to? A lot of them also resort to suicide because many of them end up being depressed as well. So it's very common to see panic with depressive symptoms. <coughs> Excuse me. What else do we use for these patients? We also provide psychotherapy. Now, the purpose of psychotherapy is the following. I told you that in panic, the attacks occur out of the blue. But in reality, there's a stressor. And the only way we find out what that stressor is, is in psychotherapy. We have to get to the root of the problem. How many of you watch The Sopranos on TV? You watch The Sopranos? What does this, the guy, what's his name, uh... Tony Soprano. Why does Tony go to the psychiatrist? Because that big bad mobster has panic attacks. And what they're trying to find out is what triggers these attacks. Because anything that triggers it, if you understand what it is that triggers it, is it possible for you to stop it? Most definitely. And that's what you're trying to do in psychotherapy. Another thing that's important here is behavioral therapy, relaxation techniques. Let's say you're driving home and you feel that you're about to have an attack. What should you do at that point? 
breathing exercises, use visual imagery where you see yourself lying on some beach, drinking pina colada, and maybe you can stop the attack. Maybe. If you have mastered the ability to do so. But the number one treatment will always be medication. How long? For months. Do we need family sessions as well? Do you think this affects the family? Always put in family sessions. Always put in psychotherapy because it will not hurt you. Is this a patient that could end up in the hospital? Yes, especially if they're suicidal because it can occur. And that would be really the only time you hospitalize patients who have panic disorder. You feel comfortable treating panic? Okay, let's move on. Okay. <coughs> uh, this is the third case. Chief complaint, he deserved to be punched for the way he was talking about me. A 28-year-old man is brought to the emergency room by police after he punched a man at the bus stop. The patient said that he had to defend himself because the man was disrespecting him. Let's stop right there. If someone is, if you're standing at a bus stop and someone is aggressive towards you or says something nasty about you, is it possible that you punch him in the head? Does that make you sick or having a problem? Does it really make you... Is there something wrong with punching someone in the head who says something or does something to you? What do you think? You can say it? My license is on hold in New York, so I cannot admit you, so say whatever you want. Um... When asked to explain, so this could be a logical, a common, a rational scenario, okay? If someone approaches you and they're going to clobber you in your head, what do you want to do first? Do you want to clobber them before they clobber you? Does that mean that you have a problem? Not necessarily, but let's find out what's going on. When asked to explain, he insists that the man was talking about him and telling people that he had a terrible body odor. Let's stop right there. Well, what do we think of that? Could that be a delusion? Or could it be true? Are there smelly people in the world? Yes. He has a history of two other arrests for assault in the last two years. Now, this is significant. Maybe this is not something that occurred once, but maybe this is something that he has a history of doing. So here we see the chronicity of the situation. He insists that none of these were warranted because the strangers he assaulted were the ones out of line, usually by talking about him. So what do we call this when you believe that you're being talked about by others? That's called paranoia. So this is a man who obviously appears paranoid. He thinks people are talking about him. He thinks, pe he thinks people are disrespecting him. Where do we see paranoia typically? We see it in psychotic disorders and we also see it in, in drugs. Is there anything medical that can make you look paranoid? What? Don't tell me tumors or anything like that because how many times do we order CTs on schizophrenics? Not many, trust me. Unless I worked in some research center. If not, it doesn't get done. So think of the obvious. Let's continue to do the an evaluation of him. He's dressed appropriately and does not emit any significant body order. This is significant. Why? The fact that he doesn't emit odor is significant because he thinks that people are talking about him saying that he smells so in real in, <coughs> excuse me in reality he doesn't smell so what do we call that he has this belief that's not true that's called a delusion okay he's verbose so he's talking a lot he's talking a loud voice loud voice and frequently circumstantial do all of you know what circumstantial is when you go um, it takes you forever to reach the point in the conversation but you do reach it He's angry and his affect is blunted. Here's a clue for you. Whenever they mention affect in a question, and especially they're referring it to it being flat or blunted, the first thing I want you to think of is psychotic disorder. What else medically could give you this blunted or flat affect? Parkinson's, where they have that mask-like face. So his affect is blunted. Blunted, by the way, is less than normal. Flat is no emotion whatsoever. Do all of you remember what affect is? Affect is I'm going to look at your face and I'm going to tell what your emotion is. So it's how we express our your, your emotions. 
Uh, he's obviously wary and his eyes frequently dart between the window and the door. This means that he's hyper vigilant. If you think that people are out to get you or want to talk or are talking about you or you're paranoid, what you're probably going to do is any little noise, you're going to look. So you're constantly looking. Your eyes are darting all over the room because you don't know where someone is going to come out of and do something to you. And that's what he is obviously doing. He's very suspicious. He says he's angry because people are always talking about his life. He's unable to sleep at night except for when he has a kitchen knife on his bedstand because voices are saying that someone is going to hurt him. So not only does he have delusions, but he also has hallucinations. And that is important because now we've just ruled out one disorder. And which one did we rule out? Where do we have delusions? We have them in delusional disorder. We have them in schizophrenia. But where do we not have hallucinations? In delusional disorder. After a while, he refuses to respond to more questions saying that the FBI is recording the interview. So again, here we have more of these bizarre thoughts. The thought that he's being persecuted, he's being listened to, that people are saying things about him. What would be your big differential here? We're thinking schizophrenia. Which one? The paranoid type. What else are we thinking? Delusional disorder. But we already know how we ruled it out. Why? Because there's no hallucinations. What else are we thinking here? Drugs. What drug would it be? Cocaine or amphetamine. So what would we have to do? We're going to do the urine tox screen. So there we go. Schizophrenia, paranoid type. Delusional disorder. Brief psychotic disorder can be a differential, but we know that it's not because of one line in that, in that case. Brief psychotic disorder is only up to how long? One month. How long do we know at least he's been acting like this? For at least two years. Why? Because we know he's been arrested at least twice for the exact same thing. And that has been going on for two years, so we know that cannot be the answer. Paranoid personality disorder is also a differential, but it would be very easy to rule out why. People who have paranoid personality disorder basically function, and they've been like that all of their life. How long has this guy been like this? Basically for at least two years, so we know that can't be it, but we're going to get to more of these. The substance-induced psychotic disorder. So if we think drugs, what's the first test you want to order? The urine tox screen. What are we hoping to find there? cocaine but what do we find nothing so we know it's not drugs that's your big differential really okay let's talk about schizophrenia schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder it affects men and women equally except men tend to get it when they're younger for you to be diagnosed with schizophrenia and I already went over this differential basically it's going to be the same. You're going to have delusions, but what kind of delusions? Bizarre delusions. Delusions that no one in their right mind would think that they're true. You're also going to have hallucinations. Typically, what kind of hallucinations do you have in schizophrenia? Typically, auditory hallucinations. For the purpose of the test, if they ever mention visual hallucinations, I do not want you to think schizophrenia, but I want you to think drugs. This is someone who's probably using drugs, could be in withdrawal from drugs, so they have these visual hallucinations. The hallucinations that these patients typically hear are bad ones. They, have, they hear bad voices, derogatory, nasty, you're evil, you're bad, you're terrible, why don't you kill yourself, why don't you kill your mother, why don't you kill your husband. That's basically what the voices tell you to do. You can also have the disorganized speech, and as well, you can have negative symptoms. And of course, how long has this been going on? For six months. For you to have schizophrenia of the paranoid type, what you tend to have most of will be delusions of either grandeur or persecution. And which one of the two does he have? The grandeur, the, the delusion of persecution, exactly. Of course, it's going to affect your life. It's not due to drugs. Let's talk about delusional disorder. Again, you're having delusions, but these tend to be believable. That's the main difference between delusions and delusional disorder and delusions and schizophrenia. 
If I tell you that I am the owner of American Airlines, what could that be? Could that be possible? Yes, it could be possible. But because it's not true, then what is it? It's a delusional disorder. Because it could be possible, it means that it's not bizarre. If I tell you I'm the queen of Pluto, could that be possible? I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure no one in this room thinks that I could be the queen of Pluto. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that would believe me, but most people would not. That would be a bizarre delusion, and that's what you would find more in schizophrenia rather than here. And what's important about delusional disorder is that basically these patients are still functioning. Is this guy in the case functioning? You think he's functioning, hitting people left and right, getting arrested? He's not functioning. Um, brief psychotic disorder. You're going to have psychotic symptoms. What's important is that it's more than one day, but less than one month. Because this man had these symptoms for at least two years, we ruled out brief psychotic disorder. What if the question were the following? He hit someone at the bus stop, uh, and he hit him again at least three times for the next three weeks because he thinks that they're talking about him. Then what would be his diagnosis? Because I've only mentioned a three-week time frame as opposed to a two-year time frame, then we know that brief psychotic would be the answer. Let's talk about paranoid personality disorder. How do we know this is not the answer? What do we know about personality disorders in general? They're nothing more than maladaptive patterns of behavior. These are things that we have been doing all of our life. These are things that we do that drive everybody else crazy. But as far as we're concerned, there's nothing wrong with us. So when you compare a schizophrenic versus someone with a personality disorder, who do you think is functioning at a better level? Those with personality disorders have friends. Those with personality disorders go to work. Those with personality disorders, their symptoms really don't interfere in their thinking process. In the patient, in the case, are the symptoms interfering with his life? What do you think? Yes, he sleeps with a knife next to him. He thinks the FBI is listening in on the conversation, and we know he's been arrested several times. What is it about the paranoid personality? They're suspicious. They're mistrustful. They think people are talking about them. They um, always accuse other people of being disloyal. So they accuse their spouses of having relationships. That's what's typical about the paranoid. It's seen a lot in individuals who are recent immigrants into the country. Why? Because they don't speak the language. Have you ever listened in on anybody's conversation and they're not speaking a language you understand? Don't you always think they're talking about you? Maybe I'm projecting. I don't know. But that's what they tend to do. You tend to think that they're talking about you. Do you watch Seinfeld? Remember that one episode with Elaine where she would get her nails done at a Korean salon and she was convinced that the Korean women at the nail salon were talking about her? So she took George's father who spoke Korean. And what do you think happened? They were talking about her. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what you find in these personality disorders. They always think people are talking about them. Also more common among the deaf. And why do you think that is? They don't hear what's going on. They're basically out of touch with what everyone else is saying, so it's very common for them to have these thoughts. And you treat this, of course, with psychotherapy. The drugs I already went over in the previous case. Because it's cocaine or amphetamine, what are we going to have? psychotic symptoms which ones the paranoia hallucinations can all be seen in cocaine induced psychotic disorder and we treat it the same with antipsychotic now let's talk about what we do with him because that's what the test is all about what do you want to do admit or treat as an outpatient who says outpatient <coughs> Think of New York City, which is where we are right now. Picking fights, fighting with people. What do we have in New York City that we don't have in other cities? 
We have, well, no, Giuliani not anymore. Let's not get... We have subways here. So there's the risk of danger. Do you leave someone out in the community who's punching people left and right? What do you think? Of course not. So the first thing we need to do with this patient is do what? Offer hospitalization. What do you think Mr. Punching Bag is going to say? Yeah, he's going to punch you in the face. So whatever you do, you need to tell him where you are making sure that you have adequate distance. Whenever you meet with violent patients, what else must you do? Make sure that you are the one standing by the door. Not have the patient by the door and you in the room. Why? Because then if the patient decides to attack you, how on earth do you get out? You have to be the one that does the running and not the patient. So if the patient becomes violent, you want to be by the door. All right? And your back is to the door, not to the patient. You don't talk to patients who are violent giving them your back because forget it. You're going to get hit eventually. When you speak to someone who's very violent, how should you speak to them? Should you be violent, angry, and agitated yourself, or should you try very calm, calmly approach the patient? You should very calmly try to approach the patient. Try not to stand while the patient is sitting because that creates a sense of power. So you want to sit with the patient. You want to talk to the patient in a very calm manner. And you're going to say to the patient, Mr. Whatever, I think that you've got schizophrenia, paranoid type, and I think that you need hospitalization so we can provide treatment. What do you think he will say? Wow. Wow? No. I said, no, I'm not going to go into the hospital because everyone there talks about me and everyone there is going to say that I smell. And do you try to say, no, you actually don't smell, you smell like roses. You do not, you do not ever try to talk about patients' delusions in the emergency room or anything like that because all it does is agitate patients and again, you're going to be in a situation where you've got an angry, psychotic patient in front of you and you know that your life is going to be in danger. So confronting delusions leave it alone what we want to do is admit the patient the patient said no what do we do can we admit him involuntarily let's go over the criteria again is he mentally ill yes is he a danger to self others are gravely disabled does he meet one of those three which one danger to others so he is a keeper we admit him involuntarily only if what only if he refused to sign himself in, which he did. We're saying he did. We admit him into the hospital. What do we offer him? Medications. Which one would you like to provide? How do we treat psychotic symptoms and aggression? We use antipsychotic medications. So we're going to talk to him about antipsychotic medications because does he have to consent? Yes. He says no. He doesn't want the treatment. What do we do then? We go to court. But let's say he says yes to the treatment. Okay, you've convinced me. I'll take your medication. But I want to know all about it. What do we talk to him then? There's two types of antipsychotics that we're dealing with. We're dealing with atypical antipsychotics, and we're dealing with typical antipsychotics. What are the main differences between the typical and the atypical? Let's do the older ones first, which are the typical. How do they work? On dopamine, they treat positive symptoms. What were the positive symptoms? Hallucinations delusion, bizarre behavior, bizarre speech, etc. And they have a lot of side effects. And that's what we need to make sure that that patient understands. What's the first side effect that this patient can experience? It's something called a dystonic reaction, which is a spasm that can occur in the neck. So they get torticollis, they can't move their neck from side to side. They could also get something called oculogyric crisis, where their eyes roll up, And they cannot put him back down. So if I'm talking to her, I'll be talking to her like this. My eyes are rolled up, but I'm talking to her because I cannot bring them back down. And that tends to occur within hours to days of treatment. And he's a high risk. Why? Because he's a heat. You tend to see it more in young men. So dystonic reaction is that spasm that occurs. If he were to develop a dystonic reaction... What's your next step in the management of this patient? What do we use to treat these patients? Anticholinergic medications. 
You can give them either benztropine or diphenhydramine or trihexylphenidyl. So benztropine, diphenhydramine, or trihexylphenidyl. Of those three, they will never give you three and make you choose one. The ones that are used most frequently are benztropine and diphenhydramine. And you know why? Because they come in an IM preparation. Benztropine is cogentin and diphenhydramine is Benadryl. Because many times these patients experience laryngeal spasms. So if you have a laryngeal spasm, how easy is it for you to take a pill? It's not going to happen. So that way I can give you a shot and the side effects go away. Many treatment facilities, and this is something that they can't ask, must you put someone, if you treat with haloperidol, must you add benstropine every single time? What do you think? A lot of facilities, probably facilities in the cities, in the major cities, anytime you use haloperidol, for example, they'll probably give the patient benstropine. But does that have to happen? No. Does every single patient get dystonic reaction? It only occurs in about 10% of the patients. The problem with that is the following. If you've got a patient who doesn't want to be on medication and you give them one of these medications and they get one of these weird side effects, that's going to freak the patient out. So what will eventually happen to compliance to a patient who did not get this side effect medication? Are they more likely or less likely to take the pill? you know they're much less likely to take the pill. That's why so many facilities, the moment you get put on an antipsychotic, an old one, they're going to put you on benztropine. But does it have to occur? No. Because then that's one more medication that the patient is taking. If you've got a good rapport, a good relationship with your patient, this is how you approach it. You tell the patient, I'm giving you a medication that can give you side effects. But if you do get side effects, I have another medication that will stop it right away. So what I suggest you do is the following. Fill the side effect medication. Always keep a few pills with you. If you have a side effect, just take one of the pills and you'll see how the side effect goes away. Can you do that with every patient? Of course not. But if you've got a good relationship with a patient, then maybe that's something that you could try. What else do we tell them about the older medications, the typical ones? Besides this tonic reaction, what's another side effect he could get? Parkinsonism. What do you get? The tremors, the bradykinesia, the slowing of all the movements, the mask-like facies. And how do we treat Parkinsonism? We can adjust the dose or we can switch medications. You treat it the same way you would the Parkinson's disease. What's another side effect that we worry about? tardive dyskinesia. That's typically seen when you've had the patients on antipsychotics for at least three to six months. And it's characterized by involuntary movements of the upper extremities, the face, the tongue, the lips. So you have lip, um, uh, lip smacking, tongue protrusion, you get choreoathetoid movements that the patients typically can control for short periods of time, and they tend to disappear during sleep. Who's at highest risk to develop tardive dyskinesia? Elderly females, especially elderly females who have an underlying mood disorder. They're at higher risk than anybody else. If the patient develops tardive dyskinesia, how do we treat that patient? What we should do is that we switch them to another medication. And which medication are we going to do the switching to? The newer drugs the risperidones or the olanzapines or clozapine or whatever that may be. What's another side effect of the typical antipsychotic medications? They can also cause something called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS. NMS. What's important about NMS is the following. The patient is on the medication, especially high-potency drugs like haloperidol. So they're on their medication, they develop fever, they develop rigidity, they develop autonomic instability, and the way to treat that is with either dantrolene or bromocryptine. And that's how we treat NMS. Other side effects of the older drugs include anticholinergic side effects, uh, side effects blurry vision, urinary retention, constipation. You also get a lot of sedation, you also get a lot of hypotension. Of the older class, which is the one that will give you the least amount of anticholinergic side effects? Haloperidol. 
Which one will give you the most amount of these side effects? Chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine is rarely used today. I mean, I don't know of anybody that uses chlorpromazine, which is what Thorazine is. Why? Because it has a lot of side effects. It's very sedating. You give that to a patient, that patient is going to go, and they're going to drop immediately. Not only are they going to drop, but their blood pressure is going to drop significantly as well. And you don't want that to occur. So what's safer, or what's the safest, I should say, among the older ones? The ones that's used most frequently would be the haloperidols. So he says to you, you know, I don't like any of these side effects that you've mentioned. You haven't convinced me so far. What do we do then? Let's discuss the newer drugs, the atypical antipsychotics. How do the atypicals work? They work on dopamine and serotonin. They treat positive and negative symptoms, and they have much less side effects. What are the atypicals? The first one that hits the market is clozapine. came out in the late 80s, basically. Then you've got risperidone. Then you've got olanzapine. Then you've got quetiapine. And then you've got ciprazidone. And those are the drugs that are available today for the treatment of psychotic disorders. Clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine, ciprazidone, and risperidone. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for that. Now, of all those that I mentioned, only one is not used first line. And which one is that? Clozapine. Why? Because the risk of death is too high. Patients who are on clozapine can have agranulocytosis, approximately 1%. So because of that, you stay away from it. Let's talk about the other ones that are used first line. Risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, and ciprazidone. The ones of those four that is least sedating is risperidone. So if you want less sedation then the one you choose is risperidone. So if they give you a case where the patient is always sleeping and they're psychotic, then which one might you want to use as opposed to the others? Then you might want to use risperidone because the sedation is less. The problem with risperidone is the following. If you remember dopamine and how it worked with side effects, remember the older drugs worked mostly on D two. The newer drugs work mostly on D4. Well, guess what risperidone works on? It works on D2 more than D4. So the side effect, as far as movements are concerned, are different for risperidone than for all the other drugs. So if you have a patient who does not want tremors, who does not want EPS, even though it's a newer drug and it's supposed to cause less of it, of the newer ones, which one will give you the most amount of tremors and the most amount of EPS? It's going to be risperidone. That's why risperidone, it tends to be used in doses less than 6 milligrams a day. Because if you raise the dose, all you're doing is increasing the movement problems. And patients don't like that. Now let's talk about the other atypicals. The olanzapine, quetiapine, and ciprazidone. They have a lot of sedation, a lot of weight gain. So if you have a schizophrenic patient who sleeps all the time, then these are the ones you should avoid. Avoid olanzapine, ziprazidone, and quetiapine. Of those three, let's talk about some specifics. Ziprazidone has been linked to cardiac conduction problems. So anybody who has a cardiac conduction problem, do not use Ciprazidone. So before you start anybody on ciprazidone, what do you want to do? You do an EKG because it tends to prolong the uh, QT interval. All of these drugs also cause, uh, I told you weight gain, I told you sedation, and several of them can cause diabetes. They don't know why it causes it. They think that it's because you're gaining weight you're more prone to suffer from diabetes. And what's important about it is that if you stop the medication, what do you think happens to your glucose levels? Your glucose levels basically go back to normal. So if you have a diabetic patient, maybe one of those three is not the way to go. Maybe you want to use risperidone instead. But again, what I'm saying I think is a little bit too specific to be on your test. So first line, which is what's important here, 
for the treatment of any kind of psychotic disorder will be antipsychotics. And among the antipsychotics, what do you think will be first line? It will always be the atypical antipsychotics. Not just regular antipsychotics, atypical. So if they make you choose between haloperidol and risperidone, what is your answer? Risperidone all the time. The test is not worried about money or anything like that. Why they, they, uh, did you read, I think it was the New England Journal or JAMA, it might have been, the, I don't remember which one, came out with an article maybe a month ago comparing haloperidol and risperidone in the treatment of schizophrenia. Did any of you read that article? Well, pretend you did. What do you think the article said? Without reading the article, you know what the article said. I mean, one of my friends was talking about that. I said, don't tell me about the article. This is what happened, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm guessing. What do you think happened? People on risperidone got better. Why did they get better on risperidone? Do you think risperidone works better than haloperidol? No. They stayed on the medication. So if you stay on the medication, you are going to get better. People on haloperidol develop side effects. They stop the medication, therefore they do not get better. And that was the only difference. So always use a typical before you use typicals. Now, if they're giving you a whole bunch of atypicals, then you know that they're working with a specific side effect. And the one that they'll probably hit you with is the sedation one. So if they give you risperidone and olanzapine, what is it that the question will probably say? Someone who sleeps a lot or someone who doesn't sleep at all, and you're dealing with psychotic symptoms as well. In the hospital, remember, who are we also going to get involved in the case? social worker. We want social services involved. Number one, patients who are psychotic, patients with mental illness, a lot of times do not have a place to go. So we need to make sure that we could get them into a residential program, into a shelter, into some housing that will provide a roof over the head and many times will also make sure that these patients take their medications. Um, once they're in the hospital, what will determine how long the patient stays in the hospital? For this patient in particular, what must we assess before we decide to discharge him? That he's not a danger to who? That he's not a danger to others. If you go into the room and he says, oh, the nurses were just talking about me and they say that I still smell and I've taken five showers today and I got so angry, doc, that I almost clobbered one of them what does that tell you about that patient? That patient is not going anywhere. So again, the reason they got you in, you got to make sure that it's not there before you discharge the patient. First line, atypical antipsychotics. Social services, and would you provide intensive psychotherapy with someone like this? What you provide for someone who is so sick is something called supportive psychotherapy where they go to the doctor or therapist and you basically help them build trust. You want them to feel comfortable talking to you about anything. You make sure that they take their medication, you talk to them about work, did you find a job, how's it going at your apartment, tell me about your day. That's what supportive therapy is all about. They're not lying on a couch, they're not talking about dreams and they're not talking about their mother. That is too intense for someone this psychotic. Schizophrenia okay? Let's talk about a few more things that is not in the case here. Uh, this will be just a few minutes. So in the emergency situation, and you're dealing with someone who's schizophrenic, all we use, always use an atypical over a typical. However, if the case is set up in such a way that the patient will not take the medication by mouth, then what are we left with? Then we're left with the typical, the older drug, haloperidol. If the case is one where compliance is the major problem, the patient's been hospitalized four times, five times, six times. Every, every time you release him, he goes out, he stops taking his medication, and he comes back weeks later. If that's the case, then what they're looking for is a treatment where compliance is not so much of an issue. And what is it that they're talking about? Long-acting shots. And there's two drugs that have that. Flufenazine has it and haloperidol has it. 
flufenazine decatoate, that's the shot where you give the patient the medication every two weeks if it's flufenazine. If it's haloperidol, it's every four weeks. So if it's one of compliance, give the patient a shot. Therefore, instead of them having to take a pill several times a day, all they have to do is go to a clinic every two weeks or every four weeks and get a shot. If it's a patient who basically has a lot of negative symptoms, not doing well, has been tried on numerous medications, then what they want you to put down is clozapine for that case. So compliance, the shot, flufenazine haloperidol. If nothing has worked for the patient, lots of negative symptoms, then clozapine is the test answer.